Um, welcome to Savannah Jazz, a panel discussion on the history of jazz in Savannah. I'm Luciana Spraker, director of the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Savannah Cultural Arts Center and to the Archive's first local history program in this new venue, which is dedicated to art and culture in Savannah. This evening, we're gonna touch just on the tip of the iceberg of Savannah's jazz, rich jazz history through a wonderful panel discussion that's moderated by our former mayor, Dr. Otis Johnson. He's both a lifelong educator and jazz lover. I don't wanna steal a lot of time from our panel, so I'm gonna give them the briefest of introductions, but that certainly doesn't give them the due um, that each of them have earned through their accomplished careers. So Dr. Uh, Johnson is joined on the panel, um, going from the left to the right, um, by Dr. Thomas Teddy Adams. He's a renowned musician, excelling in the trombone. He's one of the first inductees in the Savannah Jazz Hall of Fame, as well as co-founder of the Coastal Jazz Association and the Savannah Jazz Festival. Next to him is Mr. Theron Ike Carter, former president of the Coastal Jazz Association, former chairman of the Savannah Black Heritage Festival, a frequent lecturer on the history and development of African American music, and he served as director of WH, WHCJ Radio for over 20 years. And I also wanna thank him for providing the music that we enjoyed while we were waiting to get started. Next to him is Dr. Charles Elmore, local historian, retired professor, emeritus of humanities, and former head of Mass Communications Department at Savannah State University. He's the author of All That Savannah Jazz, From Brass Bands, Vaudeville to Rhythm and Blues. And last but never least, Ms. Huxley Scott, regarded as one of the greatest jazz and blues vocalists of the region. Ms. Scott is the original vocalist of the Savannah Jazz Orchestra and was a bronze medalist for the 2004 American Traditions Competition. She was inducted into the into the Savannah Tribune Gospel Hall of Fame and the Savannah Jazz Hall of Fame. So you can see we have a great lineup for this evening. They have a lot to share with you. We're gonna to try to squeeze a lot into a small amount of time. Um, and so with that, I'm just gonna let you know we're not really planning to do a formal Q&A session, um, but the panelists will make themselves available to you after the program. Um, for questions. So I'm gonna turn, um, turn it over to um, Mayor Johnson. He's got great questions lined up for our panelists this evening. So with that, I'd like to get started. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very happy to see all of you here, and I know that you're in for a treat because we've got, oh, probably a couple of hundred years of knowledge sitting up here. <laughs> And uh, we're uh, very anxious to share what we know about this art form. And so we're going to start, uh, uh, and I'm going to direct this question um, to Ike Carter because uh, for many, many years he had a show, it still has that show on WHCJ, uh, where uh, jazz was the, the major uh, music form and he has I think a unique way of talking about this art form called jazz and then I'm going to uh, go to uh, to uh, Teddy Adams and then to our resident scholar uh, Mr. El Dr. Elmore so we'll we'll start in that order and then if, if Huxley wants to chime in, uh, feel free. But we want to start talking about what is this thing called jazz? You know, and it's a little rip, you know, what is this thing? You, you, call love. Call love. Call love. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we're going to start with a discussion about what is this thing called jazz? And we'll start with Ike. Well, um, it's hard to, uh, uh, to uh, condense into a um, uh, presentation uh, that you know is short and concise, but uh, uh, you'd be talking for a long time because it, it really is is much more than the surface. It's much more than music. Uh, we know it as a, a musical art form, and and uh, just off the top, I, I do not like the word jazz, I, I do not use the word jazz. Uh, I, uh, I, I call the music uh, African-American classical music 
because that's what it is. Uh, uh, but that's neither here nor there. So-called jazz <laughs> is, uh, is uh, used for familiarity, but uh, the musicians who created the music did not call the music jazz. They didn't name that. Other people named, named the jazz, you know. Right. Uh, and jazz had a whole other meaning, uh, very somewhat vulgar meaning, really. But it, it, I think it's... it's, it's um, uh, Good to say that uh, the music, the art form, raised the level of the, of the title of of, of the uh, uh, the name jazz. It, it made it respected all over the world. I still don't like the word, but anyhow, um, what is the music? Uh, you know, and you, if you're looking for a definition. Um, I think I, I know I don't know who it was that said that uh, you know if I have to uh, explain it to you I, I never could uh, uh, you know but uh, it, it the music is a part of the people who created the music improvisation which is one of the the main uh, tenets of the music one of the, one of the main elements of the music uh, uh, is a way of life. That African Americans had to uh, had to have in order to make it in this country. We, we had to improvise. Everything was uh, uh, improvised. I mean, we were given the uh, you know the uh, uh, the worst parts of uh, the meat, the the the, uh, uh, the the pigs. You know, we were given the uh, intestines, and and we made it a delicacy. Uh, Improvisation, impro improvising to uh, uh, to make it, and that's what the musicians do in, uh, in 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 the music. They take a musical a melody, and then they uh, uh, play the melody, and then they start recreating the melody over and over again. You know, uh, for how many choruses okay. they play it. Okay. You know. Okay, Teddy. In your book, you talk about this art form and you have a, a another unique way of talking about it. Uh, tell us how you describe it in your book. Uh, I don't give a def definition. I have uh, two very, 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 very hip quotes at the beginning of my book. One by Duke Ellington and the other by a Savannian by the name of Raymond Ray. In the jazz world, he's known as Big Black. Duke Ellington said, if you have to ask, you'll never know. <laughs> that was his definition for it. Big Black said, if you want to be there before you get there, you got to be gone before you leave. <laughs> that's a Gullah Geechee saying. And, and that's, that's the basis of improvisation. Uh, when a jazz musician is playing, it's like a paradox. He plays, he doesn't know what he's going to play and he knows at the same time. And he has to think ahead. It's created within the moment. There's no other music like that where you make a profound creation within the moment without premeditating or getting it together before it's done. It's done within the moment. Professor, what is your take on wrestling with a way to describe this art form? Jazz, I'd like to go back to a literary illusion. Tony Morrison, the great Nobel laureate, wrote jazz. And jazz music is like black life. It is a sum total of how black people had to cope with being slaves, how through their dances, their work songs, and um, gospel music, it became entwined in the improvisational tenet of being black. It's tough to be black in jazz, Tony Morrison said. So we as African-American people have to 
ride the vicissitudes of life, the difficulties of life, and improvise and make do. Like uh, Ike said, we ate the chitlins. Then after a while, folk took the chitlins from us and had fried chitlins and <laughs> well now thinking them all. So jazz is about the improvis improvisation of life. And not only black life, but all jazz musicians. And I think that in writing all that Savannah jazz from brass bands, vaudeville to rhythm and blues, it showed in Savannah how as early as 1909, when the Pekin Theater was down on by St. Philip Monument, St. Philip's, not St. Philip's AME Church, uh, there was the Pekin Theater, and they had their own band, and they were playing music. Professor Miller out of Cincinnati was the band director for the Pekin Theater in 1909. And I could go on and on, but for in the sake of time and not hogging the, hogging the time, I'll leave it at that. All right. Huxley, would you like to add anything to the way you see this art form? Yeah, I'm a newcomer, so to speak. Yeah. And um, <laughs> what to I this find... Group. <laughs> huh? What? Yeah, compare this to about old geezers. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but there is a point at which we are all in the same boat, baby. Oh, and yeah. And I'm there yeah, now. Yeah. I'm there. Um, as a younger person, I had to have a definition. And it's really kind of hard to do that. But as I call myself a lay person, compared to this esteemed panel here, and this is what I would say. It is, I am, I have to hold on to lyrics that were written by someone else. And I respect the music that was written by somebody else. But I get a chance to fly and give my own take mm -hmm. on what they've done. Mm -hmm. And that is the way I see it. And when I look back, I have always done that with songs all my life, even though I didn't know that's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So that's my the idea of this form being a representative of the African-American experience needs to be explored a little more because it is the essence of a people expressed in an art form. And I'd like you all to, to go a little deeper into how did it come to be the expression that so captures uh, the black experience, in, in well, especially in the United States. It has uh, connections to other people in the African diaspora, but this is a, a, a little unique form that came out of our experience here in, in North America. Well, I, you know, if, if I may, you know, uh, uh, the great uh, poet and writer uh, Amiri Baraka, when he was uh, Leroy Jones, uh, <laughs> wrote a book called Blues People. Blues People. And in, in, in his book, he talked about the blues, and I can piggyback that on to so-called jazz, but the blues is an African-American uh, outlook on life, how we view uh, everyday life, how we... Uh, how we uh, see things that are happening around us. And Dizzy Gillespie gave a really good analogy as to the difference in African-American classical music uh, and European classical music in that uh, in European classical music, the composer is the, uh, the major, the composer writes the music, but he not only writes it, he notates how he wants it played and how mm -hmm. to play the music. Mm -hmm. So that you, it's always gonna, supposed to be played that way. Mm -hmm. And this, and Dizzy Gillespie said, it's like uh, our music is like uh, getting up and going to work and working all day. And uh, uh, in the European classical, the musician would get up, go to work, and and come back home and go the same route every day. 
But in our music, you get up and go to work and you take a different route every day. You never do it the same way mm -hmm. twice, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I thought that was a, that was a pretty good analogy. Yeah. Uh, also, this, you know, it, the, the one of the major things that I wanted to emphasize is that uh, is what the music makes you feel, how you feel. You know, when we were youngsters and starting to listen to the music, when you described whether or not you liked a musician or a piece, some, you said uh, uh, it moved you. Mm -hmm. uh, this cat moved me, you know. Uh, this cat didn't move me. I, you know, I, 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 that didn't move me. So it's a, it's a very, uh, it's like a spiritual communication between the musician and the listener. I like to say this. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to go to the, liter the literary references. I remember for years when I taught humanities at Savannah State to many students, including the songbird, one of my favorite students. Uh, the combination or the integration of the humanities with jazz. And I remember teaching so many years by James Baldwin. We know it's James Baldwin was a truth teller. And he spoke about the human condition of Americans. So much so that he later on became an expatriate and lived in Paris. But he wrote this one short story called Sonny's Blues. Mm -hmm. And Sonny's brother was successful and Sonny um, fell on hard times with drugs and went to jail, but they were musicians. So here I free, they found each other, and Sonny was a piano player, and there was the brother on an instrument, the bass player, and Sonny was not really getting himself together. And suddenly he, he and his brother played, and Sonny fell in and he found his voice. And a voice that was developed from hard times and hard days. And finally, Sonny and his brother found communication. And the piece they were playing, Sonny went off into the Imperium. He went off into what they call solo flight. Jazz music is solo flight. Feelings that don't just come by written down scores. Sometimes they write jazz music, but the improvisation and the ability for he and his brother to find each other. And that was beautiful. So when I think about how the humanities and jazz merge, I think about James Baldwin, one of the voices of the millennial, and of how the impact of the humanities on black life, black music, especially jazz music. Teddy? <clears throat> there is a book written by Samuel Floyd called The Power of Black Music. He references a term in there that I wasn't familiar with, but as soon as he explained it, I realized that I knew it all the time. He calls it cultural memory. Mm -hmm. Cultural memory. Meaning that as African Americans, Africa is within us. Whether we've been there, whether we know anything about the blues, has nothing to do with it. If you've been affiliated, associated, or if you're akin to anybody from the origin, which is Africa, then you, it's imputed to you, you have it. That is imputed to the music. If you check the music out, beginning with the voices and the drums of Africa, and it's still debated whether the voice came first or the drums came first musically. Okay, we know that the voice was, was first utterances, but musically, it could very well be the drums. If you follow the different eras, the voices and drums of Africa, field songs and field hollers, mm -hmm. and, 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 and you talk about the blues, you talk about spirituals, all of that has an African connection. That's why black churches, even though they're worshiping, they're, they're Christians and they're worshiping the same God that all Christians do. If you ever go to a black church, mm -hmm. there's a difference in the service mm -hmm. and it could be traced back to Africa. 
Yeah. That same trace, that same difference, that same kindredship can be identified with the music, whether it's jazz, whether it's any kind of music. And it's based on cultural memory. It's been passed on, passed down, yeah. and you have it whether you wanted it or not. <laughs> yeah. And if you're not a part of it, then you cannot produce it. Yeah. If I could, if, could, could I just piggy, piggyback on something that uh, Teddy said? Because uh, Samuel Floyd also, in, in, in the book, talks about uh, the th two theories of the creation of the music, uh, syncretism and survivalism. Syncretism is the theory that uh, Africans uh, came over here. I mean, they, we didn't come, we were brought over here, and that we uh, came in contact with European music and we, we created our music based on that contact with U European music. Survivalism says is what Teddy just said. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, I mean, the music was in us, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, 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 and it is a part of that uh, cultural memory. Yeah, that's a very profound book. Uh, All right, let, let, let's talk about the, the relationship between jazz and blues, because a lot of folk, uh, want to say one came before the other, uh, but I'd like to hear your take on what is the relationship between the two. Teddy said it first. Mm -hmm. uh, Field hollows and shouts. Jazz, is, oh, the art form commonly referred to as jazz, Thank you. is a, a <laughs> derivative of the blues. You know, if uh, if you know anything about the blues, you can uh, liken that to uh, spirituals. They both started off slow and sad, talking about hard times, you know. And then that, that blues turned into rhythm and blues. The tempo was picked up and it stopped being sad. But uh, there are three chord changes in the blues. Musically speaking, it's one, four, five, and it's just numbers. Music, music technically, mm. whether you play it linearly, vertically, harmonically, it's nothing but numbers. Numbers. And one, four, five, meaning the one is in four steps up, it's four, then five. And if you know anything about music, five always takes you to one. The blues is based on three chord changes. Every hymn in your standard hymn book based on the same three chord changes. Piano players have a tendency to embellish and make it work and make it sound sophisticated <laughs> and differently, but it's based on only three chord changes. And in the beginning, uh, blues and jazz didn't have any chord changes. It was modal. They just no form. They just improvised, and, and, and it was about feeling. As we became acquainted to European music and found out about form and chord progressions, then something else happened. But it's still about feeling. Uh, Thelonious Monk made a very, very profound statement about feeling and about creativity. He said, you show me a musician without an imagination, and I'll show you a guy that needs another job. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know, to, to, to amplify Teddy's point about uh, uh, um, the chord changes, the, the basic uh, uh, 12 bar blues and the modal blues, if, if you look at the blues of Mississippi and the Delta, they came uh, with, the, uh, with the, uh, uh, the 12 bar blues, of one, four, five. Uh, and then in northern Mississippi, the blues was modal and it remained. I mean, it remains that way today, and you can still uh, it, it, nothing is nothing is new. Uh, if you, you know about the uh, uh, West African tradition of Sankofa to look back to go forward, yeah. so you have to understand that uh, uh, at some points uh, the musicians, when the music is threatened, when the art is threatened, the musicians always go back to the beginning. You know, if if you listen to uh, well, Miles Davis was in bebop and the you know a bunch of chord changes and 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 everything. But when Miles changed, 
uh, and when he uh, in, in the sixties, uh, he went back to modality, to modal blues and like kind of blue and mm -hmm. milestones in those albums. Yeah. So it always keeps reinforcing itself. You know, it's a living thing that keeps growing and expanding. And if you don't understand that, you know, you say I can help you. Just one thing, not to be uh, hoggish, <laughs> but, but, but modality, give you an example. Very few chord changes, sometimes only one. Uh, to the layperson, a song with a lot of chord changes is difficult to play because of it has many chord changes and it's hard to stay fresh and improvise over those card changes, chord changes. But think about this. You may have several chord changes, so you have something to choose from and to work with. Modality means you may only have one. It's very, very hard to be improvisationally fresh and improvise over one chord change. Several chord changes, you have no choice. You got a lot to work with. But to be creative on one chord change, that is a challenge. And in the beginning, blues and spirituals were all modal. It had no form. When they got ready to make a change and go so they would, but it had no form. The European influence gave it form and, and progressions. Everything was modal. You know, and from that, we, I'll give credit to uh, Western music. It did have an influence on jazz, but uh, that influence had nothing to do with the essence of, 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 of improvisation because it, improvisation, true improvisation, is inherent. It's innate. If you don't have it here, you can't learn it. If you haven't experienced it, you can't play it. Now, is that what we call having soul? Uh, uh, simplistically speaking, yes. And I think in, in writing Beloved, uh, Tony Morrison called it the nomo. The yeah. Yeah. As a matter you of fact, have it or you don't have like, it. Like I remember reading, uh, looking at a documentary, I was at the University of Georgia at a conference once, and I was in my room that night. I think it was Rufus Thomas on the documentary. And he said, you is or you ain't. Or you, ain't. <laughs> yeah. you have it like Teddy said, or you ain't. Yeah, well, one, you know, nomo is a, a very important element. It, it's a West African word and means the, the power of the spoken word or the power of, of, of the music. And that, that, that's, that's, that, that's that, that, that essence in there that you, I mean, I never, went, I, I never tried to find out why, you know, I just appreciated that I could hear it and understand it and feel it, you know. But uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's so important to understand that uh, the music, when you're talking about soul, uh, in my opinion, first of all, you know, when, when, when our ancestors came over here, they were packed into uh, uh, ships. Uh, and a lot of people think that this was a homogenous, uh, homogeneous group mm -hmm. of people, but it wasn't. There were different people from different cultures that spoke different languages. Yeah. And, and they, you could have to imagine these people being taken and put in, into bondage. They didn't know where they were going or what was happening. And they're riding over this, this, uh, uh, this long journey. And uh, uh, they can't call out to anybody. They're not speaking the same language. Uh, you can imagine how terrifying that would be. So the only place that the people had to go was within themselves. And that's what, to me, that's what... Uh, that what soul is. So I mean, when when we were brought over here, everything was taken culturally: our language, our clothes, our names, everything. But they couldn't. They took the drums when they found out we could communicate with the drums over long distances. But they couldn't take the music because the music was in the people, and that's what I call uh, the unseen umbilical cord that connects us to Mother Africa. Yeah. You know, you can't take it away, you know. Right. Now, there is uh, an alleged difference between the way 
this music developed in New Orleans and in that area as opposed to the way that it developed in Savannah and over here on the Gullah Geechee coast. Uh, Y'all want to speak to that? I speak to that. All right. In my book, All That Savannah Jazz from Brass Bands, Vaudeville, to Rhythm and Blues, make a cut along, couldn't have make the story short. Down in New Orleans in Congo Square, where the slaves congregate, played their drums, they danced. And then the music they had, the Prussian marches, the French quadrilles, and uh, they developed the stuff like ragtime, which was like European, uh, you know, arrangements, kind of Western music. And then from that, from ragtime, ragtime rather, here comes uh, the early guys like Buddy Bolden and uh, Freddie Kepper and Louis Armstrong and Storyville. And then when in Storyville, that's when that hot jazz uh, really flourished, I think, but had more of a European kind of beginning. But then Louis Armstrong and those took it to a, a different level. But like here in Savannah, we had more of an African influence, like everything that Teddy and, and Ike said in terms of Africanism is in us. And we didn't have the Prussian, the French quadrilles. It came from within us. So we had a kind of, I call it a Sea Island kind of jazz mm -hmm. as compared to the more really sophisticated uh, General Martin said he was the father of jazz. That's not true. <laughs> but he said that. But it was based on that European, European system of musical composition. And Louis, like on West End Blues, the first cat to go out there and just take the notes out of the charts. Improvisation. I just want to make that point. Well, you know, uh, uh, Buddy Bolden is uh, reputedly the first man to improvise in New Orleans. He's a trumpet player. Uh, but when you talk about Congo Square, New Orleans was one of the only places that uh, gave uh, the slaves Sunday off. So on Sundays, they would gather in Congo Square and they would jam. You know, uh, 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 they would play on homemade instruments, whatever they could find, they would, would play. But you have to also understand that you got these same group of people who are different from different cultures. So you have all of these culture, cultural uh, images coming in the music, different and emerging, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and becoming one. Yeah. Uh, and that is, uh, uh, that is, that's really uh, African because the other people, I mean, like I said, it was, it was very different uh, cultures and different people but when they got together and got this music, that made it not from one particular culture, but it was truly African. I mean, uh, otherwise you could be Ghanaian or Somalian or whatever, but when you merge the cultures together, that's African. Yeah. I like uh, New Orleans, Congo Square. New Orleans, and I, I pondered this a long time, it's a personal opinion. New Orleans was the only place that did not deprive the slaves of the drums. Every other place in America that had slaves, the drums were forbidden. Okay, so rightfully, you can identify New Orleans and Congo Square with the Sunday Jam Sessions as being the birthplace of jazz. But I'll give you an example of something that happened to me about 10 years ago. I wrote a song for my grandson. And if you know anything about the street musicians and the music of New Orleans, mm. the rhythm is called second line beat. Yes. Second line. Mm. So what I felt for the song that I wrote for my grandson was a second line rhythm. So I told the band, of the drummer in particular, giving me the New Orleans second line beat. And the drummer at the time was my adopted son, very good friend, Quentin Baxter, one of the mm -hmm. most talented drummers I've had the pleasure of knowing and playing with. Yeah. And he said, Dad, let's try this. Rather than the second line beat, let's try the Gullah Geechee beat. Mm. He played it for me. 
very, very similar and independently similar. Mm -hmm. You know, so rather than second line on my recording, I use the Gullah Geechee beat because <laughs> it's almost the same thing. So the, the continuity, the, 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 the similarity, it's there. And, and, and when you're talking about Gullah Geechee, the essence of Gullah Geechee is Charleston, South Carolina, yep. Beaufort, mm -hmm. going out to Sea Island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's where it is. Yeah. And uh, uh, the similarities are, are frightening. Uh, I was talking to someone from New Orleans two weeks ago at, at the club that I, I play at, and we were talking about the second line beat, and I took my phone out and played the song that I wrote. And I said, this is the Gullah Geechee beat. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, it's almost the same. Yeah. Almost yeah. the same. Yeah. When, when, you, when, you, when you look at the map of the slave trade and see where we came from, uh, there were direct routes into New Orleans. Mm -hmm. There were direct routes into Charleston mm -hmm. and Savannah, mm -hmm. Mobile, those, those mm -hmm. places. But they were collecting the same people from all yeah. over yeah. West Africa. Yeah. So th there was going to be a similarity in some way or another. Yeah. When the amalgamation took place between all of these different cultural groups, that something would emerge that would be common mm -hmm to folk in New Orleans, in Mobile, as well as Savannah and Charleston. Uh, but you know how each area wants to claim their <laughs> uniqueness. Yeah. But uh, if you look and study the culture from whence we've come, yeah. Uh, yeah. we were coming from all of the same places, yeah. brought together mm -hmm. and had to amalgamate yeah. into a new culture. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, uh, there, we, we really need to keep that in mind. Well, see, a paradox, different but the same. Different but the same. That's yeah. a great way to put yeah. it. Now, let's look at some of the key venues uh, in Savannah because uh, Savannah has a long history of having places where jazz music could play. And uh, your book, uh, Dr. Elmore, really describes a lot of those early places that provided a, a venue uh, for this music. Okay, I'll say this. As early as 1909 on Thanksgiving Day, Josephine Stiles opened the Peking Theater. As I, re as I to go back to what I said earlier. Tell them a little bit about the Peking. The Peking Theater yeah. was based on the Peking Theater in Chicago of Bob Motts. Yeah. And they played, uh, they had all the vaudevillians. There was great vaudeville in Savannah. And uh, people like the like uh, 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 the great uh, what's her name? Uh, like uh, Johnson, the, the the piano player, played the Pekin Theater when it became a part of the theater owners' uh, booking uh, association. It says usually says uh, tough on black actors. And Savannah was a key city in vaudeville, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Ma Rainey played the Peking in 26. Jimmy Johnson, a great jazz, 16 jazz hounds, played the Peking in 1926, just before it closed. Bessie Smith sang at the Peking in August of 1911. But she didn't come back to Savannah until she played in Municipal Auditorium, where, where the Civic Center was really in 1934. And not only did we have the Pekin Theater, we had in, in, uh, in the, into the, the 20s, you had groups like uh, Frank Dilworth Jr. playing with Ted Powell and Syncopated Six. That's another thing I want to tell you too. We, when we talk about the development of jazz music in New Orleans, there was a continuum here just like Teddy's talking about that was the same. But it wasn't Buddy Bolden, it was Ted Powell. It was uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Al Cutter, it was like Raymond Snipe and the Golden Syncopators. So we had the same kind of music. And heck, Storyville in New Orleans was Frogtown <laughs> and Yamacraw. As a matter of fact, uh, James Johnson thought so much of black culture when he came to Savannah, he wrote a 12-minute jazz 
composition called Yammy Crow mm -hmm. that premiered at Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not only can I tell you, when we go to the, after the 20s, the, made the big spots in the 30s, you had the Manhattan Club by William Bradwell on that. You had the Hollywood Casino out there in West Savannah. You had the Coconut Grove that opened on April 4th, I think, April of 1936. My great grand, my grand aunt, my grand uncle owned it. And, but they, the key thing is, they had all of these main jazz groups. Savannah was hot. <laughs> we think about in the 20s, they wrote in the, uh, in the Baltimore Afro American that Savannah was one of the, the sin cities of the, of the country. <laughs> <laughs> they had prostitution, they had, you name it, we had it. And you had, uh, you had uh, oh, walking down West Broad Street, funeral, uh, funeral marches, leading bands, leading people to the cemetery at Lower Grove. I remember some of those in the early 50s. I was a kid. And I remember my, my, my dear friend Sam Gill, whose many of his notes I used in my book, saying when he was a kid in West Savannah, in West Savannah, going to West, uh, the cemetery there, they come down Augusta Avenue, They'll be playing a dirge slow. And once they per the person was interred, Josie Broom was one of the drum majors, and Joe Miller's brass band, they come out and they start blasting on it. When the Saints go marching in, it was on. Yeah. And uh, when, so when you talk about venues, then you have to get to the 40s and you get to, to Gus Hayes. You get to Powell Hall in the 30s first. You're talking about some people being in Savannah. Uh, Frank Dilworth Jr. took over Powell Hall in 1934, which is the building now. It's called the Con Ed Building of Connors Temple. And from 1934, he developed the Georgia Rhythm Kings band. Not only did they play Savannah, they played Virginia. They played New York. They played Florida, South Carolina, all over the place. Uh, Mamie Smith sang at, the, at Powell Hall. You had a lot of female singers. And we think about Huxley right here, our songbird. Her spiritual uh, progenitors were Mamie Lee Sticks Bradley, who sang with Jim, 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 James Drayton. And you had Marilyn Kilroy, who sang with the Georgia Rhythm Kings before Jimmy Lunsford took her. But I don't want to hog it up now. Yeah, I was just stop. All right. Well, no, let, no, no. Let, let let me, uh, uh, no. Let, yeah, let, Annie. Annie uh, Annie yeah, Kilroy, yeah. no, Annie Kilroy was, uh, Miss Kilroy was married to Marilyn Kilroy's brother. Oh, okay. That's how it goes. I know some, some right. young sister. Let, 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 me, let, let me get Huxley in here. Uh, Huxley, Not fine. What, what were some of your influences in terms of what you heard when you were a young woman that perhaps influenced you in terms of your style and your love of the music and how you approach it? That's, that's a, a hard one for me because I fell in love with songs first. It, fell it in didn't love with matter what? who was singing them. Yeah. Um, but I fell in love with the songs first. Okay. And then later on in life, Carmen McRae, because oh, she, you know exactly where the periods, the commas, Exclamation points, everything is when she sings. Oh, yeah. And um, Lou Rawls, because I like the way he oh, handles right. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those were the ones. But I, in, in the very beginning, I didn't know anything about jazz, not definition, not nothing. Just a bunch of men telling me, you need to learn this song because this song separates the men from the boys. You remember that, Mr. Adams? <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't, I mean, it was not information available readily like it is now. So I had to do lyrics and sometimes I, I listen at records and sometimes I couldn't understand what the vocalists are saying, that's the pet peeve of mine. I gotta know, because I'll never know where the periods and the commas and the exclamation points are if I don't know what you're saying. And um, so I would, you know, I got what I needed from records. But later on, Lou Rawls, Carmen McRae, because I understood what they were saying, the whole of what they were saying. All right. Uh, just to piggyback what Huxley was talking mm -hmm. about. You know, musicians, uh, instrumentalists, 
we have a reputation for tolerating vocalists. Amen. <laughs> we, can, we can take them or leave them. But my test, uh, since I was kind of forced to deal with vocalists, mm -hmm. I knew how to the weed, the weed, the real ones out from, from the quasi. Yeah. And uh, I have two songs that are always, and Huxley knows about this. I assigned her to Chick Corea Spain mm. and mm. Billy Strayhorn's Lush Life. Mm. Wow. I said, you get those two for me and you can talk to me. Yeah. Of course, she mastered all both of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. That was hard. No. Mm. Yeah. That's like quite a test. But you know, Teddy Adams would know about the venues that were like in the 50s. Yeah, because he and was playing Because he was, you know, he, and Teddy's a little younger than I am. And we were both in high school. But uh, I mean, I couldn't go to the joints to hear the music no. or, or see. But Teddy could get in because he was a musician. He was learning, learning then. He he played them all. So he's talking about Frog Town. He he can tell you about the Shine Joints and and all of the places <laughs> where they were playing playing the music. Yeah, because he was a part of it. Right, he, Teddy. You know. When 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 did you start playing? Uh, I started playing professionally in 1956. I was 14 years old. Yeah. And uh, a guy by the name of Clay White gave me my first job. Mm. And. Uh, I had the unique experiences of having four band directors and all of them were jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. And I had the experience mm -hmm. of playing with all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Elmo mentioned Gus Hayes, an unsung hero. Mm -hmm. Gus Hayes advocated jazz until he died. Every club that he ever owned, and he always had a club specialized in jazz. He had no other kind of music in On West Broad Street, which is known now as Martin Luther King Boulevard, there was a place called Bop City. Mm -hmm. Then it was Pete City. Mm -hmm. And then later it was Gus's Lounge. Yeah. He allowed nothing but jazz in those clubs. So my hat's off to him. I mean, without compromising. If, if Gus Hayes had a club and he had live music, it was going to be jazz. And that was all right with the musicians. Uh, one thing I wanted to uh, <laughs> jump on, because I really mm. thought I, I, I needed to say this. You know, we, we were very fortunate to uh, <clears throat> grow up in Savannah. And uh, I mean, if you, if you like the music, because we had mentors who taught us about the music. And you, those of you who didn't know uh, uh, Dr. Johnson, Teddy, and myself were all members of the band at Beach High School. Of course, Dr. Johnson was a little younger, uh, and he, you know, uh, he was a rookie when. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, uh, so we we had the advantage of uh, of uh, of having mentors who uh, who taught us the right things about the music. Who taught us that uh, uh, the music was a great art form, and uh, and I wanted to mention one of my uh, uh, biggest. Uh, heroes in the music was my high school uh, biology and chemistry teacher, uh, Raymond Washington. Amen. He used to bring his music, to his, he had an extensive collection, and he would bring his records to school, yep. and lunch period he would lunch play period. the music. Yep. And if you wanted to come in and listen and learn, uh, you know, you were welcome. But if you wanted to come in lollygag, Mr. Washington would, uh, you know, put you out. Uh, but and it was serious, and he taught us the seriousness of the music. That this was a great, great art form, yeah. and you know I have carried that with me uh, all of all of my life. I, I guess I developed my passion for the music. Uh, a lot of it was developed right in Mr. Washington's classroom, yeah. and that was you know uh, people like that who made such a, a big contribution to the development of young people never get get recognized, yeah. you know. I remember when um, the Columbia Record Club first started, oh <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they would send you every month uh, <laughs> these little booklets with certain albums in it, mm -hmm. and then you could uh, either send the thing back saying, I don't want one this month, or get the album, 
And that is the way I started my collection yeah. as a result of being exposed to Raymond Washington. Yeah. Uh, he was a good chemistry teacher, boy, but I learned to love jazz as a result of those lunchtime get-togethers in his room. That's so smart. I owe a lot to him. Yeah. Smart. And I don't even know if he played an instrument. No, he no. was a musician. He just, he just loved, loved the music. The music. Yeah. You know, he, he just... Smart. Two things about venues. We, we can't leave without talking about the Melody Theater. A cast like Eddie Cleanhead Vincent played, Jimmy Lumpson played the Melody, all on the East Side. Say it's just now a church, not St. James Church. Yeah. yeah. And the East Side Theater had a lot of uh, uh, singers and, and big time acts, as well as the Dunbar Theater and the Stars, Star Theater. Just want to make that point. Yeah. My mother worked at the Melody Theater, so I used to see a lot of movies for free. Because <laughs> the Melody was between East Broad Street School, where I was in elementary school, and home, which was on Anderson Street wow. at this time. So I had to walk by the Melody every day. So I would stop and, and, uh, and uh, see some movies. Did but, that later become something else? Yes, not so. That was the East Side later. Theater? Same thing. No, the East, no, no, no. The East Side Theater is still, still there. It's, it's, it's there. No, but I'm saying, in relation to where the Melody was, where was the East Side Theater? On the right. corner of Gwinnett and... Uh, it's still there. It's still there. It's, it's still, still there. there. The mm -hmm. building is still there. It's but falling apart. It, on the but it's corner still there. of Gwinnett. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gwinnett yeah, that big building. That's, that's where it is. That's the East Side Theater. And uh, the Melody Theater in St. James Amy Church. Yeah. So it was the same place? Yeah. Now, Teddy... Yeah, yeah. Something happened to jazz after you left in Savannah. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but tell us about how jazz just went into a hiatus and how you and Ben uh, were responsible for bringing it back. Uh, <clears throat> Ben came to Savannah in 1950, Ben Tucker, in 1972. I was living in Tokyo, Japan. I met Ben in 1967. He came over with a, uh, an all-star group. It was Ben Tucker, McCoy Tyner, Wayne Shorter, Art Blakey, Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, and uh, Jimmy Owens. That's when I met Ben. I had no idea that I would run into him. Savannah again. Yeah. Uh, I came to Savannah, I returned here in 1976, found that Ben had a radio station. The puzzling thing about, uh, upon my return here was uh, the music was dead, but the musicians were still here. Mm -hmm. I never understood that. They were here and they were playing, but jazz was diminished. So uh, he and I had talked, and uh, I had to read really twist his arm because he said, I'm a businessman now, I'm no longer a musician. Bertha, his base, was in storage in New York. He didn't even have it here. So I talked him into uh, getting out of storage and, and starting to play again. And as a result of that, the uh, Coastal Jazz Association, uh, the Telfair Tel Jazz Society, yeah. where we gave monthly concerts at yeah. the Telfair Academy of yeah. Arts and Science. And, uh, the uh, Savannah Jazz Festival. It started in night. Coastal Jazz started in 1982. One year later, we put on the first festival. It was a one-day festival in Grace at Grayson Stadium. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years, a one-day festival. Little by little, it was expanded into a week-long festival. It is, it, but it's always been free. It has always been free. And. Uh, not taking any credit for it. it, it the musicians were here, and, and, and the essence of the music and, and, and the legacy that Savannah has always been known for was still here. It had to be tweaked once again. So when he and I got together along with Kenny Palmer, a very fine pianist, mm -hmm. and a few other people, and, and, and Huxley is the youngster up here compared to, yeah. to our ages, but she was the... Uh, first vocalist with the Telfair Jazz Society, and that was the first organized uh, band uh, associated with the resurgence of jazz in this town. And uh, 
then the Savannah Jazz Orchestra. She was the first vocalist with the Savannah Jazz Orchestra. Uh, all we did was rekindle mm -hmm. the legacy and the history that Savannah was known for. Yeah. See, prior to I-95, I-95 allows you to bypass Savannah. <laughs> prior to I-95, yeah, yeah, 17, you had to come, come smack dab to the through river. Savannah. Savannah. Yeah. Being a seaport town, and like Dr. Elmo said, a town of infamy by <laughs> reputation, <laughs> people, it, it, it drew people. I mean, you know, entertainers, musicians, jazz, rhythm and blues musicians, blues musicians. Sometimes they would be going from the northeast to the southeast, coming through and say, well, now Savannah is, is reputed to be a town we're stopping in. They, a lot of times they wouldn't be booked here. They would stop here merely because we had venues and there was some possible work. One of the greatest uh, bass players in the history of jazz, the great Oscar Pettiford, he had a traveling show with his family. They came, he came to Savannah, uh, Sam Gill, who uh, Dr. Elmo referred to, mm -hmm. uh, and set up a tent in West Savannah. And they stayed there long enough doing nightly jazz shows for his sister to marry a Savannah. So they yeah. were here for a while. <laughs> and they played the... They, played the um, um, they were here for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we, we want to close this out by talking about some of the great musicians that Savannah has contributed to this art form. And Teddy, uh, you uh, are involved with the sponsoring of the Hall of Fame. So just go through a few of those names of great people that we have uh, spun off into the world well, that share this music we'll go worldwide. Back. We'll go back with uh, Jabal Smith, Cladis Jabal Smith, yeah. Yeah. Pembroke, but you know Pembroke is Savannah because when he was small, Pembroke was probably a population of about two or three hundred, yeah. <laughs> if that much. And he was uh, made an orphan and he went to school. Uh, I mean, he, he was raised in the Jenkins Orphanage in, in Charleston, South Carolina, which is a very, very, very noteworthy uh, milestone in the history of jazz. Uh, but Jabbo Smith, uh, Trummy Young, who had more playing time with Louis Armstrong than any other trombone player. He played with Jimmy Lumsden. He was also a great singer. He's from Savannah. The great James Moody. And everybody knows something about Moody's Mood for Love. One of the, an unheralded <laughs> saxophonist. Yeah. yeah. A, a great saxophonist and an original I mean, everybody draws from somebody, but James Moody had his own identity. He was one of the first guests to play flute, too, yeah. in, in the music, yeah. And it, he, uh, Sahib Shahab, uh, real name Edmund Gregory, he lived in Europe for a number of years, so a lot of people didn't know who he was. The great Irene Reed. Irene Reed won five consecutive first place spots at the Apollo Theater and then went on to join the Count Basie Orchestra, you know. Uh, the list goes on, uh, uh, the drum of the banjo, Lee Blair, great banjo player that played with Louis Armstrong. Uh, we have Sam Gill's uncle, uh, Nat Green, a trombone player, played with Louis Armstrong. Savannah has produced, and, and, and because of one collaboration, Johnny Mercer is known as a, uh, uh, part of the American songbook. Here's a guy that got, uh, he won the nine old Taylor Academy Awards for writing lyrics to songs, but one of the greatest collaborations in the history of jazz. It doesn't make him a jazz musician, but it brings him somewhat into the fold with the collaboration of uh, Johnny Mercer and Duke Ellington on the very, very famous song, Satin Doll. Yeah. You know, so, uh, Savannah, we, I, I was talking to, I've talked to several great musicians uh, we brought to the festival, and I would ask questions like, uh, this is your first time to Savannah? And almost everybody that I asked that said no, they had been here before as side men playing in different clubs here. Mm -hmm. So Savannah, what our contribution to the art form of jazz as far as the people 
that became Savannians, uh, that are Savannians, is, is, is immeasurable. James Moody and Sahib Shahab knew each other for maybe 30 years and didn't know that they were Savannians. <laughs> Moody claimed Newark, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and uh, Sahib Shahab never told anybody where he was from. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know where he was from. Yeah. And just talking one night, they found out they were both Savannians. You forgot Ben Riley too, man. <laughs> uh, ben Riley, one of the greatest drummers. Uh, five years with Thelonious Monk, three and a half years with Sonny Rollins. When I interviewed him, my first question was, let's name some of the people you've played with. Then I caught myself before he even answered. I said, I think a more appropriate question would be who have you not played with? Yeah. It was very few people. Yeah, the great Ben Riley. Yeah. The great Ben Riley. Well, yeah. we, 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 we are constrained by time. Uh, if it was up to us, you we wouldn't have a, a time constraint, but we got one. Yeah. So we're going to have to bring this uh, to an end. And I'd like uh, to thank the panel uh, for sharing with the audience uh, their knowledge of this art form, uh, sometimes called jazz, but called many things by many different people. <laughs> and we're going to stay around for questions and answers and give you an opportunity uh, to ask us questions that may be on your mind. So I'm going to turn it back now uh, to the people in charge and let them do what they have to do. Um, well, the first thing we need to do is thank our wonderful yes. moderator and panel. And, um, and obviously, we just scraped the surface. So we, you know, right off the bat, we knew that this probably might need to be the first of uh, other discussions. Um, I want to briefly ask um, Paula Fogarty, the executive director of the Savannah jo Jazz Association. She's going to give us a really brief update on some of the um, things they're doing to help recognize the history of jazz in Savannah. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you so much, too, to the city of Savannah for hosting this and for being the lead sponsor for our jazz festival every year. It really has become bigger and bigger every year. How many of y'all came to the festival this year? Oh, yay, great. That was fun. We were so blessed with good weather, too. Boy. Um, so I want to thank the city again um, for hosting this and this panel that we are very privileged to learn from tonight is going to be sticking around in longer form with the Savannah Jazz Association. We're just rebranded, by the way, from Coastal Jazz to Savannah Jazz because this distinguished panel are, are serving as our advisors for one of our biggest projects ever as a 37-year-old keeper of Savannah's jazz legacy. Um, it is the Savannah Jazz History and Hall of Fame exhibit that is slated to open at the end of 2020. We do have some brochures in the back of the room where Teddy will be signing his great book, The Up of the Downbeat. Um, but this will be our first chance to tell for a very long time in perpetuity this rich story of Savannah's jazz history and this distinguished panel is serving as our advisory committee to ensure the authenticity of the story, to ensure the, uh, the legacy of the story, not only as a, a legacy for uh, the Savannah Jazz Association, but it's a legacy for the city of Savannah itself, deepening the history and the stories that are told about Savannah and its importance importance in the world of jazz. So it is going to be great for both residents and visitors, and it will be our ongoing education uh, program. So if you're interested in learning more about it, you can go to savannahjazz.org and click on the exhibit project and take home one of these brochures, too. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Paula. And as she mentioned, um, Dr. Adams does have some copies of his book in the back if you're interested in getting a copy um, from Dr. Adams. And again, I want to thank um, our moderator, Dr. Otis Johnson, and our generous and talented panelists, Dr. Teddy Adams, Mr. Wright Carter, Dr. Charles Elmer, and Ms. Huxie Scott. And thank you all. And if you could please um, fill out your evaluation forms, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.